Hi, everyone. Um, I'm excited today to introduce you to Dr. Christiane Northrup. Actually, I'm certain she needs no introduction because if you don't know who she is, then I don't know where you've been hiding because I actually believe just about anyone I know knows who she is. And this is why I'm really excited to have her um, on my Facebook Live show today. And, um, and I have a, an official bio of hers, which... Um, which explains who she is. For those of you who don't know, she is an MD, board certified OBGYN, former assistant clinical professor of OBGYN at the University of Vermont College of Medicine. And she's, of course, a New York Times bestselling author. But um, I would actually like to tell you a little bit more about, about her from my own personal experience. I think she is just an awesome human being. She's very brave for speaking about the things she does. Because when I share my story, when I share things that happen to me, I always say, I am not a doctor, but I am speaking from personal experience. Here is Dr. Northrup, a doctor, a medical doctor, who says a lot of things that actually make me feel that she's verifying what I've said. And she's saying it from the perspective of doctors. My own doctors who treated me, who knew what happened to me, would not be willing to stand up and say those things. And so this is why Dr. Northrup and her work means so much to me. And if you haven't read her work, if you haven't seen her, I ask you to check her out right now. And most recently, she did a series of videos which really had me hooked. And she's got a book coming out, which I would, I would love to get my hands on. <clears throat> and I'm suggesting everybody listening to this, everybody who follows me, Who's, um, to please get your hands on it. So anyway, without further ado, we'll get into all of that soon. I'd like to say hi to Dr. Northrop. Hello. So nice to see you. <laughs> it's so wonderful to connect with you. I think we haven't spoken in a while, <clears throat> although there's a tremendous amount of affection, which um, whenever I see you, I just feel, oh my gosh, I have to give her a hug. <laughs> <laughs> Last time we were in Florida, it was Fort Lauderdale, and they were having flooding, because I remember riding on the bus over to the uh, Hay House event, <laughs> going through a lot of water, but seeing you there. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. 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 That was kind of fun. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, your most recent work, which is uh, your book, Dodging en Energy Vampires. So what I love about it and what I haven't read it yet, and I can't wait to get my hands on it, but I watched the three videos that you put out through Hay House. And I, yeah. was, I was like waiting for the next one. And, then, <laughs> <laughs> and I was doing these Facebook Live videos and I was telling my followers, you've got to check out these videos. You've got to check out these videos. It's exactly what um, I talk about. And I know all of you will relate. And I keep telling them that because I feel I had to die to learn that I was an empath and that I had been sucked dry by energy vampires. It took death to set me free. I love that you're saying it because it's just plain the truth. And I knew from my medical background and from my years of being on the front lines, I knew way back in the 80s, I would have patients and I would say, if you continue what you're doing, you're going to get breast cancer, you're going to get this, that, and the other thing. And I always, I knew it. I knew it intuitively. And, yeah. uh, and there are some relationships that if I had not gotten out of, I would have been dead of breast cancer. I know it. And it would have been bilateral, inflammatory, dead in three months kind of breast cancer. I know it. Now, yeah. can, I, can I prove that? No, I can't prove that. But if I were, you know, if people were smart... <laughs> <laughs> they would pay attention. You had to die to yes. figure it out. This is very, very real, everybody. It's very, very real because we were not taught how to manage our energy. Here's what we're taught in our culture. Okay, this is like the, the empath's litany, right? Oh, he really has a good heart. Oh, <laughs> he didn't really mean to do that to me. Um, or one that I got recently. Oh, so now you're marginalizing the mentally ill. Oh, you mean <laughs> mentally ill who are running the country? The, the mentally ill who are running uh, most corporations? You mean the mentally ill who are sexually abusing children? Those mentally ill, I think we should protect them a little more. How about no? Oh. 
I'll tell you what galvanized me. I was, um, Harvey Weinstein's story just galvanized me. And it was in October of 2017. And I was in Florida on vacation. And suddenly, now normally I don't watch the mainstream media. I know who runs it. I've been, you know, yep. interviewed a million times. This story got my attention because here's why. It was the first time in my entire career that a perpetrator was brought to account. That, some, that uh, the women who came forward, came forward and for the first time in my entire career, people believed the victims, not the perpetrator. Because the perpetrator's been running the system. The courts, medicine, big pharma, the government. For, That's it. For centuries. Let me just put that right out there. So finally, though, the tide has turned. And then not only did Weinstein uh, come tumbling down, but Louis C.K. and Charlie Rose and Matt Lauer. Now, let me just make a distinction here. Those, there's a continuum of energy vampires. So the worst ones, we would say a 10, are psychopaths. No conscience whatsoever. That's one in 25 people, and that means there are 100,000 of them in New York City alone. When you hear the term psychopath, when people hear it, they think psychopathic killer. They think Charles Manson. No, yeah. no. They're just normal people with no conscience. And they're charming. This is interesting. So I just finished watching on the Netflix documentary. Yeah. The, it's called Wild Wild Country, and it was the story of Rajneesh coming to Antelope, Oregon. Ah, uh, I've seen that. Okay, so when you looked into his eyes, what did you see? Those are not the, the eyes of the Dalai Lama. No, no. Nope. Those are the eyes of a psychopath. Okay, yeah. Now I understand. I understand. I'm putting myself out there because there's still all these people who are followers. Now, that is the, that is the whole point. There's these people. So there's the psychopaths. Then there's just the everyday borderline personality or narcissist. And that's one in five people. And here's the issue, everybody, because you're listening to Anita. This is, you know, the near-death experience. The all is light. We're all one. Yeah, okay. That's maybe true in the fifth and sixth dimensions after you die. It is not true in the third dimension of Earth. And I believe, by the way, in the book, the first people I thanked in the acknowledgments were all the energy vampires in my life. Why? Without them, I would not be who I am today. I would be, I'd still be scared. I'd still be walking on eggshells. I'd still be allowing them to suck my power away. But luckily, I could have called the book Dodging Energy Vampires an autobiography. <laughs> Let, let's be very clear on this because if you're born an old soul empath like me, and you've been on the planet over and over and over and over and over, you hold a lot of light. And mm -hmm. your job is to just be the light. Here's the problem though, Anita, because we are light, because we believe the best in everybody, Yes, the darkness seeks us out. It seeks us out. So I like to say, you know, you haven't been chosen, you've been targeted. So many of these narcissists or energy vampires, men or women, are charismatic. They're really good looking. They're at the top of the game. They're exciting. They're, they're the, the ones that you want to be invited to that party. Yeah. And, you know, everyone else seems kind of boring. Whoa, yawn. But th these people, you have to realize, when you're not giving them energy, when you're not constantly plugging your energy into them, they deflate like a balloon. You, I've seen it over and over when they're not the center of attention. They're the most boring people on the earth. Why? They're fueling their lives from you. Whereas you and I actually fuel our lives from source, from God yeah. direct, directly. So any guru, any person in a, person of, uh, in a place of power for most of human history the written part, so let's yes. say 5,000 years, these have been the people running the planet. Yes. And now we're waking up. But we've been, we've been systematically taught, oh, you know, my childhood, uh, think it, but don't say it. Um, 
you call a spade a goddamn shovel. Because I pretty much could see this stuff early on. I had an aunt who was a total um, sadistic pediatrician. Her, really? her entire uh, career, as far as I could tell, was to brutalize young women with children, who she was very jealous of. Wow. However, my family protected me, her. My dad would say, oh, you know, she's the only Aunt Harriet you'll ever have. It's very therapeutic for me to talk about her because she's dead. And, um, you know, he'd say, she's the only Aunt Harriet you'll ever have. And I thought, why do I need even one? This woman <laughs> is not a nice person, but families... Um, you know, pull the wagons in a circle, and most yep. families are protecting one of these characters. And how do they hook us as empaths? A sob story. Oh, yep. my wife left me, and I can never see my kids, or it'll be... And so those of us who believe, and we know that our energy is healing, it does uplift situations, and we quite naturally are drawn to the darkest because we believe that we can heal them. And our, yes. this is our big lesson. It's yes. an inside job, whether you're going to be healed or not. It's not because another person will do it for you. We all have to do it ourselves. You cannot be someone else's higher power. No. And that's taken me a lifetime. But the reason that I wrote the book, there's a lot of books on empaths, and that's important. I wanted to show people how darkness works, capital D, how darkness works. Because once you know how it works, then you begin to see it, you see how it works. And some woman just sent me her, her book about you know, her narcissistic husband and all of his tactics and she kept the emails and all of that. There was a time 20 years ago when that book would have helped me because you can't believe the way they lie and manipulate. Now yeah. it's like, that's, that's just what they do. They lie and they manipulate. Yeah. So, uh, and, and what is going to tell you that it's that kind of person? Your gut. But here's the problem. If you are a man or a woman with what Sandra Brown calls super traits, now this is important. There's a certain subcategory of people who have what she calls super traits, and they have corroborated this with research at Purdue. So here's some of the super traits resourcefulness, practicality, loyalty, optimism, can do. Now, we see the red flags. Here's yeah. the key. But we don't think those apply to us. Here's what we say. Oh, no other woman could help him. That's why he went through those, those three women. But he hasn't met anyone like me. I can uplift this character or this woman or whatever. I can do it. So we see the red flags but we don't think we can be harmed because we are so effective in every area of our lives except these intimate one-on-one -on -one relationships. And now in my medical practice back in the day, in anyone's primary care practice, 25 to 30% of their patient load will be people with these characteristics. So here's um, what it is. Okay. It's, Help me, you can't. Help me, you can't. They're just there to get what's called narcissistic supply. They don't intend getting better. They are there to drain your energy. And psychics, people who can see the energy, will see like a guru standing in front of all the young devotees. Yeah. And then they'll see all the chi, all the energy going out of usually the young females toward the guru. Yeah. I, I've had that experience with a guru as well, where the guru fed off. I realized the guru was feeding off me and the people in the audience. And, and, and not, again, not saying all gurus are like that or all spiritual teachers are like that. But at that time, I was very young. And yet what didn't escape me was that here was a guru who was saying that we need to... Um, we need to suppress our ego. We need to transcend our ego. And whereas the, probably the person with the biggest ego in the room was the guru himself. It's always and, that way. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. and the other thing is most of these gurus are men and most of the devotees are women. That is true. Although I have seen exactly the opposite. My sister and brother-in-law were involved with a female guru and 
here's how she operated. She used her Shakti, her sexual energy, to lure in the men. So she wanted my brother-in-law to accompany her on her spiritual whatevers, because he's good looking, while she had my sister uh, washing her underwear, doing seva. <laughs> doing seva. It's, it's See, like, that's the thing. The, the, yeah. And there's this, um, the belief and I think everyone needs to be aware of this, is uh, that the guru knows something you don't. And if you would just hang in there, but that's a con. That's always, when someone's telling you, I know something you don't, yes. and you don't have access to that inner wisdom, run. That's not true. Run. Here you are, right? And I've read your medical history and I've, you know, knew the whole thing. The, the very fact that your doctors couldn't just say, oh my God, we've never seen anything like this. Uh, but there's something interesting about medical training. It's, uh, it's a hypnotic state and it says, it's materialistic and hypnotic and Newtonian. So these things happen because da 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 da. And there's no place for this quantum um, energy of miracles. Yeah. And it's just not. It's not. Um, it's not yet taught in medical school. And what happens is, I think it must be so scary for the doctors to realize there are forces outside of their control because we've been taught we're supposed to be God. We're supposed to be your higher power. So if we're not, what does that mean? It means they got to tap into something bigger and greater than themselves. And that sometimes it's not, it's, it's out <laughs> of their hands, whether someone lives or dies. Yeah. I mean, you know, cause they couldn't explain, I mean, don't you love it at the end that you die and then yeah. all your tumors go away and they say, oh, it must have been the chemo. Are you kidding? It was probably the chemo that killed you. <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. And, and, and not only that, is that when, um, you know, because I've been sharing my story, of course, and the book and, and everything, and I've had people say to me that what, what you're doing is dangerous because you're giving people false hope. And I'm like, how is giving people hope dangerous when a doctor can take away someone's hope in an instant by that, saying you've you know, only got three months to live? And that's not dangerous? No, I, I've been told, I've been told once I did a big presentation at Duke when they opened their holistic center and somebody down there, one of the people called me the most dangerous woman in America, which I've always been proud of. <laughs> and I had... Um, radiologists come up to me back bef before we got the real data on mammograms. And I knew that mammograms had some real downsides. So I would talk about it. Yeah. And this radiologist came up to me, said, you are dangerous. Do you hear me? You're dangerous. Uh, you know, uh, stay tuned. 10 years later, we know that um, a lot of screening diagnosis things yes. you would die with, but never die from. So people need to know about that. So they won't be scared to death. Yeah. But this thing about, uh, you know, Bernie Siegel used to say this, there's no such thing as false hope. There's just such a thing as false non-hope. Because that's <laughs> what's false, false non-hope. And isn't it interesting that somehow, I don't know the course you take in medical school that gives you the three months to live, the six months to live, because I've seen people, one of my friends was in the intensive care unit, cardiac intensive care unit. He hadn't written out a will. So Hal is writing a will on a yellow pad with a PO2, that's an oxygenation, of 40. He should have been unconscious, <laughs> but he's writing the thing, right? Because he was operating not in three dimensions. He was operating in another dimension. And anyone who's involved in the medical field can tell you about those cases. Yes. It's, it's almost like, you know what it's like? It's like with the military. Um, I have a friend who was involved with aerospace. He yeah. said they were never, ever, ever allowed to talk about UFOs, ever. Yes. But, but when they were all in private, that's all they would talk about, is all the stuff that they had seen that was censored. And I think what you and I do is we operate in the realm where everyone knows there's something else going on there, but no one dares to say anything. Why? Yes. 
because, <laughs> because the energy vampires make fun of you. They put you down. And yeah, they do. for those of us, the really old souls who've been around a lot, we're the ones who were pushed off the mountain. We're the ones who are the midwives and the healers and the shamans and uh, the herbalists. And remember, nine million women and the men who supported them were burned as witches during the uh, time of the Inquisition in Spain and throughout Europe. And I just found out from uh, Alberto Villeldo that there's still an office of the Inquisition in Lima, Peru. Wow. Yeah. And so this is, I mean, when we say, when people are afraid to speak up around these people, yeah. there's a reason. <laughs> they have killed us in the past. <laughs> yeah, they but have. It, but now there's too many of us. And, you know, with this, with the Me Too movement and the, you know, Time's Up movement and the whatever it is, that's what this is really about. It's taking back our own power and yes. not talked out of knowing what we know. But the big problem, I think, for empaths and your audience, as you and I talk, people are going to start having names come up into their head and they're going to say, oh, God, oh, boy. Do I really have to leave the marriage, leave the job, whatever? Now, sometimes you can't in the immediate, you can't see the way out. Yeah, that's the problem that people have. They're like, oh my gosh, I'm, my finances are tied to being married to this person or to this job and I have kids and whatever. Yeah, so that's when you must call on a higher authority, as uh, the late Peter Calhoun said, who was a very successful Episcopal priest who became a shaman. And he said, you know, when you're outmanned and outgunned, you got to turn to a higher authority. And so I think that's, that's the whole key, is saying to yourself, okay, I know this is who I'm married to. And then remember also, there's this other thing that'll happen. The minute you begin to withdraw your energy, the, be the minute you begin to wake up, they will begin to give you crumbs. They'll give you little crumbs um, of, oh my God, how could I ever leave him? He's so kind to me. He understands. Remember that many, many, many of them have gone to therapy a lot. It makes them even more dangerous oh. because you go to the therapist, they cry some crocodile tears. You think, oh, he gets it. They don't get it. Yeah, they get it. Here's the thing. They get it. As George Simon points out, and this is important, they know what they're doing. It's not denial. Here's another thing that most therapists up until recently haven't understood. They're not acting the way they do because of childhood pain. And he said, that's the old belief, only hurt people hurt people. It's not true. It's wow. not. They this is so people. interesting. Yeah, they hurt people because it works. If they want you under their thumb and they know they have what I call malignant intuition, they know exactly what you've been longing to hear your entire life. Oh, you're so sexy. You're such a gorgeous woman. What would I do without you? And then our little empathic heart, because usually empaths are born into families that do not understand them at all. <laughs> Yeah, As Matt Kahn says, you know, you think that to be liked by them, you have to be like them, and you're not. So therefore, you're set up by a narcissistic parent to be <coughs> a snack for a, for a vampire. You're set up that way because the little kid, we all, we're human. Yeah, we're human exactly. Inside, wants to be seen, wants to be loved. But what if what you were seeing as a little kid? is angels or John Holland used to see people's dead pets. He'd see, you know, a poodle that was following someone along and he'd go up to the guy and say, hey, you know, um, I saw your poodle. How old were you when he died? And, you know, here's John and he realizes people don't want to hear that. So you grow up with these ability to see things that others can't or yeah. be believe things that others can't. And you just want to be loved and accepted like everyone else. Exactly. So therefore, you are set up for a vampire who sees 
your light as narcissistic supply and then tells you the things you've wanted to hear your whole life to hook you so that you become their energy source. And, and so what is our job as yeah. empaths? First, to identify these people in our lives. Uh, now, I, have, I think I put in the book, you'll know you're doing well if your first relationship was, say, with a parent. So maybe that was, you know, 40, 50, 60 years. And then, you know, you married your mother or your father. And maybe you woke up on that one at 25 years, not so bad. Then you realize that one of your best friends is like this too, but that only took you three years to figure out. Then there was a business associate. associate. You figured that one out in like two years. And then you, before they even get to your door, you can identify them. So, but usually that won't happen until you've shored up your life and you feel better about yourself and you know that they have nothing to offer. It's literally the reverse of what you've been taught because you give them your power. You, yeah. you think, you think that they can do something for you. It's always the other way around. You're the one who can do something for them, but you don't trust yourself. They completely trust themselves. And so what happens is, if you had that level of self-trust, I mean, because we empaths, we're always giving someone the benefit of the doubt. We're saying, oh, maybe I do have that wrong. We're willing to take a look. We're willing. That's the thing. They're, they're not. They're not. They're, you know, my way or the highway. They're, you know, this is the way it's going to be. And you're crazy. So we doubt ourselves. But over time, we don't. Okay, so how would you say you are now, um, years after you died to learn whatever it is <laughs> that you learned? I still fall into it sometimes. We do. I, yeah, yeah, I still, yeah. from time to time, I still see that. And I, I before I realized I was an empath, because I didn't realize I was an empath, and <clears throat> I only realized it about a year ago, and that's yeah. when I started to relate it that, oh my God, that's why I died. It was harder for me to stop pleasing people or to stop being the rescuer, the kind person, the giver. It was harder for me to stop that than it was for me to get so drained um, for my energy to be sucked out of me to the point of dying. I mean, it literally took death to free me from the hold. And, and just to say, here's the hard part, is that the people who really were the ones who I was trying to please, who I was giving my energy to, shining my light to, in many cases were people who I thought loved me or who I thought, who, they were people who, and this is what's really hard because you're not talking about some narcissistic murderer that's out no. there. And, no. and these people can be men and women and empaths can be both men and women. So it's not a gender thing. I've also no, realized isn't. that there are a, a, a lot of empathic men as well. And there are a lot Many. of yeah vampire women. And oh. even the people in my life, um, I would have to say perhaps there were more women than men. So yes. that were, that were draining my energy. I mean, oh, so. and isn't it interesting? The minute you have a need, like a real need, they they go elsewhere. I think one of the hardest things for for people is when, as they begin to wake up, and let's say they file for divorce or they at least want a legal uh, separation, the person who they have loved for 25 years gets another partner within 15 minutes. It is heartbreaking because you yeah. can't believe, you say to yourself, did this person ever really love me? It's wow. heartbreaking. Yeah. Because they didn't. Because they didn't. So the, the deal is your job is to love yourself. Yes. And you have to love yourself a little more than you love other people. You know? And that's um, the thing. <clears throat> and, and people say that isn't that selfish. But here's the thing. Chances are, if you're wondering if it's selfish, you're probably an empath. <laughs> yes. Oh, and the other thing that, that, that people wonder, and I love this, they think, oh, whoa, 
What if I'm the energy vampire? A lot of people commented on my videos and they wondered, could I be an energy vampire? I said, no energy vampire will ever ask that question. Not yeah. ever, not ever. <clears throat> That's how you know you're an empath because you're so willing to look at things to fix in yourself. So many empaths are born with an inferior ego. So we keep our ego alive by looking for things to fix about ourselves. The narcissist is born with a superior ego. They don't think anything is wrong. Yeah. And what you said is just so key because I always tell my audience that if you are attracted to my work, if you are someone who comes to Hay House workshops and you read these self-help books, chances are you need to be told to embrace your ego, not suppress your ego. Yes, 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 yes. yes. I couldn't agree with you more. We need ego development. Yes. A healthy ego is the absolute, it's an absolute necessity. Oh, it so is. I mean, yeah. it's the people out there who are taking over the world and who are using their power to control everyone else. They're the ones that need to keep their ego in check. Um, yes, now, and the thing is that there's only one way that you know people, because people are going to ask, you know, well, he's changed. How will you know if someone has changed? It's absolute contrition. Dr. George Simon talks about it. And we had a whole uh, audio session on this. Contrition means they're broken into a million pieces. They know what they've done. They no longer like who they see in the mirror. Now, let me be clear. This is vanishingly rare. Vanishingly rare. Most just get another mate, another secretary, another whatever. That, that's the history of it. You know, they're married five, six, seven times. So very few have genuine contrition. And here's the thing. So the empath's always going to ask, well, how do I make that happen? <laughs> like, how do I, uh, what's the kind of therapist I can send my <laughs> wife to or my husband or my child? And the answer is, it, there's nothing for you to do. As a matter of fact, let me give you what would help them the most. That would be you walking away. No contact. Or if you can't, gray rock. Now, this is very hard to do because as you're starting yeah. to love yourself, I'll give you an example. I had a business associate uh, who what I was giving enormous narcissistic supply to, and he purported to be in love with me and was always sending me movies and gifts and all of this. All I wanted was a contract for doing this business together. I, I couldn't seem to get them separate. Um, I mean, he was my own little Harvey Weinstein, okay? He never wow. showed up uh, without a towel, but, you know, <laughs> he was. And so a therapist I was working with at the time said, you have, to, you have to make yourself a lot less attractive. You've got to be like, you have an old gray dress or something. And I thought, damn it, I'm not going to do that. I have, I have um, worked my entire life to feel good about myself, to feel attractive as a woman, to you know, not make excuses for getting my nails done. Um, but she was right in terms of, you just don't wanna give them any of your energy. I just, wow. in, in, pub in public places, I didn't wanna show up wearing an old gray rag, okay? I just, I just didn't wanna do it. But your energy around them, has to be gray rock. So if someone's dealing with, let's say you have children with one of these characters, the, the thing is you literally cut them off at what the conversation has to be about the kids and don't listen to another thing. I'm currently uh, friends with a woman who's dating a man who was uh, married to a borderline. And of course, you know, she's a very skilled <laughs> very skilled psychiatric nurse would have to be they've got all the language all of that and she's constantly interfering she's constantly telling him about her personal life constantly telling him about her boyfriends these are boundary violations you got to have rock solid boundaries because yeah. your life energy that's atp it's made in the mitochondria of your cells it's real it's your aura so yeah. let's just talk about your aura. 
you need to think of your energy field, your aura, as a living entity that you control. So you put it out in front of you and in back of you, and the way to do it is to see it as this living membrane around you. Then put mirrors. Put mirrors on the outside of it that shine out wow. so that people stop projecting their stuff onto you. Because otherwise, you're going to be what empaths are. We are lint rollers for people's darkness. <laughs> I, I, like eh. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Yeah. I like that. But but when you start to feel good about yourself yeah. and liking yourself and liking who you are. Someone said to me on Facebook, but how do you tell who the, you know, I'm afraid there aren't any real people. Like there aren't any safe people. I said, oh, there are, but they're not going to be larger than life. They're not going to be so cares. They're not going to have those eyes. You can't take your eyes off of them. Yeah. They're not going to be. So you just need to, you need to know that. And as you, as you shore up the leaks in your energy field, you yeah. will find they don't come near you anymore because they know they know they're not going to get narcissistic supply anymore. But it is our job to shore up the energy leaks, to love ourselves unconditionally, to be as fabulous as we can yes. possibly be, you know, have more fun than we can possibly have, and let them go off. But a, a friend of mine, Bob uh, Palumbo, who's been a psychologist for 35 years, he said, but never, never make the mistake of thinking that you cannot be taken in. He said, after 35 years in this field, and I'm very good at this, if the person is really charismatic and really good looking, I can be taken in. We forget, you know, wow. this is that conversation where people say, how could women have allowed that to happen? Oh my God, all you have to do is be around one of these who's that clever. One of my lawyers yeah. said, I've been in this business and he's, you know, he's been the lawyer for, um, all kinds of famous people. He said, I have never seen anyone like this. That was the guy that uh, I was involved with, with business. So anyone can be taken in by a really powerful psychopath who has no conscience. Yeah. Most of us though can handle your everyday personality disorder and it is a morality problem. So Here's what you, what you do. You hold their toes to the fire. So a friend of mine was divorcing one of these, and she knew that the only way to get him to pay his portion of the daughter's college tuition yeah. was to have him have the discussion with her father in the room. Her father is a doctor. He is very respectable. So her ex-husband wanted to look good in front of this doctor. So they made the agreement and she signed it in front of the doctor because one of their main things is to look good. That's one of their absolute main things. They need to look good at all cost. And wow. so I said to her the other day, so is he paying half of the daughter's tuition? She said, yeah, he is. Because he knows that my father will call him out if he doesn't. So don't expect them to be of high moral character when no one's looking. See, you no. and I know character is what you do when no one's looking. These yeah. people do things, uh, same woman recently, recently got a new bookkeeper, discovered that the narcissistic husband, who had been accusing her of overspending their entire marriage, yeah. had used her social security number and her credit cards to start two new businesses with his cronies. She never wow. knew it till this is very common. Oh my they God. They look like the pillars of the community. Everyone mm. thinks they're amazing. I remember going to a grand rounds at the hospital and the subject was pediatricians who were pedophiles. And this guy gets up there and when he was an intern at Boston Children's, an infant came in with a hand slap mark right here on his cheek. You know, the wow. hand. Yeah. He discovered that this was the child of the chief of pediatrics at his hospital. Oh, my God. And he's an intern. What are you going to do with that kind of power differential? 
he went on, this guy, to become a pediatrician, and he has made it his life's work. Now, this was in the 80s. Made it his life's work to uncover uh, pediatric pedophiles, the pediatricians who were child abusers. And here's what he found. The towns love them. <laughs> he, would, he, would, he would try to um, prosecute them, and the townspeople would gather around to protect them. That's oh my how goodness. charming, that is how charming and chameleon. So here's a couple labels that I like, charmeleon and, <laughs> like and um, charm alarm. Charm, charm alarm. alarm. That's the one from George Simon. He goes, yeah, charm alarm. I like so, that So, you know, one. if they're bringing charm you alien. gifts, yes. if they're, uh, you know, like really making, you know, you're all that, charm alarm. Charm you know, <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to share a story with you of something. It's reminding me. What you're talking about is reminding me. And this is actually something I have never shared um, publicly ever before. But I'm going to share it with you because, it, you know, listening to you has actually given me courage to share this. Because, and the reason I've never shared it before is because it involves a guy who I've always been afraid that he will probably recognize himself if he hears me sharing it. Um, but anyway, before I was married to Danny, I was involved with a guy who was very charming, very handsome, um, had all the makings of being very successful. And me being from my culture, um, you know, Indian culture, I was under a lot of pressure to get married. When you reach a certain age, you're not allowed to be too choosy. You're told, don't be so choosy. So anyway, yeah. when this guy uh, was dating me and <clears throat> we actually got engaged, people were saying like, oh my God, saying that I was really lucky to get a man like him, you know? And so I'm under this pressure that, <clears throat> that, it's as if he's doing me a favor by marrying me or by being engaged <laughs> right. to me. Right, right. <clears throat> and then what happens is that um, he wasn't treating me very well, but I couldn't get out of it because in the eyes of society, it looked like, um, like who do I think I am if I leave him because he's so great, he's so amazing, he's got yes. this amazing job and all. And then what happened is I developed an ovarian cyst. Of course. <laughs> yeah. So I went to the doctor because I felt something in my abdomen. I went to the doctor and um, my gynecologist said, you have an ovarian cyst and we have to remove it. So she schedules a surgery. The surgery happened to be during the week of uh, when Valentine's Day fell. So when I went into hospital, I truly thought that he would, you know, empathize with me, support me, whatever. He disappeared. He wasn't around. Never once did he come to hospital. Didn't send flowers. Not even oh, on Valentine's Day. And that's your fiance. <clears throat> that's my fiance. So oh, he didn't God. call me. Um, after I came out of hospital, I was the one that called him, his home. And it was his mother who picked up the phone. And I said, you know, I was surprised not to hear from him. And, you know, I went through the hospital. I went through all this. And his mother said to me, you can't blame him. He's had difficulty dealing with what you've been going through. There it is. There it is. Yes. 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 Yeah, okay. You go in. You have your body cut open, right? But yes. it's him that we're rescuing. Oh, my, the poor thing. You can't blame him. He can't deal with life. And then he's got a mother protecting him for the rest of his life run yes run. So i know which is what i did did so, you break the engagement i did but when i i said to his mother but where is he now can i talk to him now and she said oh he's at the gym working out right now and <laughs> right. right because so, okay they will never miss a vacation or a workout they no really good and yeah. i ran i ran but the thing is I was the one that was blamed for breaking it off, even in the eyes of my community, my society, who saw that um, he was the he was this you know amazing, successful, whatever, handsome guy, and I was the one that was blamed for it. There it is. Yeah. There it is, and that's the kind of culture we have lived in. That's called patriarchy for yeah. five thousand years. And so the, the feminine energy, which is the empathic energy in men and women, is rising. Carolyn May says empathy is the new normal. And yeah. at this point, see, think about all the women in your culture who have gone before you who could say nothing. 
They yeah. could never say anything about that. I mean, I had, um, you know, I, and it's funny, isn't it? This feeling we have of we can't say the truth. I had a colleague in my early days as a young doctor who had an infertility practice. Only we all knew that part of his infertility practice was donor insemination with him <laughs> as the donor. After hours, after I oh my oh, gosh, I knew it. So I remember telling my mother, and she goes, "Well, you better report him." I said, "He can't. I can't. He was like the head of the whole OBGYN organization for all of New England." And, wow. and I, was, I was the young woman who, you know, was told, "Well, the women in Maine really don't want to see women doctors." So I had no power whatsoever. Oh my and gosh. But this is the story, isn't it? It of, is. Of, of women. I mean, and, you know, so it's exciting for me to bring out a book that just names it, you know, and I, I kind of love exposing those people, like, you know, saying my, my aunt's name. I won't wow. say my guy's name because I'm, <laughs> he's still alive and around here. <laughs> <laughs> Did, See, did your guy end up marrying someone else, the poor thing? <laughs> he did. He <laughs> did. And, and I have heard, and this is like, uh, you know, 25 years on, yeah. I have heard that he is still mad at me for... Um, well, because that's a narcissistic wound. You <laughs> actually... Yeah, he's mad at you. You rejected him. Nobody rejects these people. <laughs> You know, no, I mean, what did Harvey Weinstein do? He would put out contracts on, on all these women. He would tie up their stuff legally. Uh, it, it's unbelievable. And in the court system, they'll often use the court system. They're incredible at dragging a leg, at looking like the wounded party. Because you've got some resilience. You go and you have abdominal surgery, and he's the one we're worried about. It <laughs> yeah. makes no sense whatsoever. Uh, I had... A patient who's had breast cancer, her narcissistic husband was not available for that. And what he said to her was that her breast cancer was just one more difficulty that she brought to the marriage. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So yeah. anyway, that's the, that's the deal. And I'm, every family has at least one. Every family, because it's one in five. Yeah. It's a huge, undiagnosed public health problem. I want people to Google cluster B. You just go on Google cluster B personality disorder. And that's what we're talking about here. Now the real psychopaths, most of you won't have one of those in your family. Those are the ones in the news. Like that guy who was charging $5,000 for a dose of the HIV medicine, the pharmaceutical yeah. guy. Yes. Sick. That's an outright psychopath. Okay. But most of us, and also remember, like autism, there's a spectrum. So you can live with the people who have a few narcissistic tendencies, but they're not outright narcissists. And then there's the full blown. So it's a, it's a spectrum. And in my experience, the only ones who change even a little are just the ones who have a few just tendencies, but aren't a full blown, <coughs> no, a full blown narcissist who cannot see what they're doing. But remember, it's the lack of empathy. So this guy, you go in and have surgery, and he has no empathy for you. So when someone comes, and but remember, when someone comes along who tells you how amazing you are, I mean, you can imagine, I'm there as a pioneer in women's health. Everyone thinks I'm crazy, but I know that, you know, there's some things that they need that are missing that they need to see. So that made me incredible vampire bait by yeah. men and women, because I just wanted to be accepted by my profession, by uh, whatever, and, and not be attacked. So I was a, a, a setup, a real setup. I'm not anymore. Now it's like, thank you, every <laughs> single one of you. I'm sure we had a contract before I was born that we would come and do this little dance. <laughs> yeah. 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 It, in fact, you know, even um, when, when this, when I had the <clears throat> near death experience and the cancer healed in the hospital, it happened in a hospital before the eyes of the doctors, the surgeons, the oncologists. So 
when I told my oncologist what I, what I experienced and what had actually happened while I was in the coma and while I was in the other side, he believed me. He said, I have heard these stories before from other people. And he actually said that, you know, I don't even know what to write in your medical record because there's no explanation for what happened to you. So he said this to me. So anyway, after I come out of the hospital and and people are like wowing. And then I got um, um, a news reporter wanted to speak to me, uh, like a newspaper journalist said, you know, I'd really love to put your story in the newspaper. And I said, sure. So I wanted to shout it out from the rooftops. I was naive. I didn't know the pushback I'd get. So then the newspaper reporter said, do you think your doctor, your oncologist would be willing to verify what you said? I said, oh yeah, absolutely. He believed me. He knew it all happened. When he interviewed my oncologist, my oncologist reeled it in completely. Like he just said, yes, she's very lucky to be alive, but you know, we have good drugs and he just completely, um, yeah, he just kind of, uh, he threw you under he, the bus. He threw me under the bus. He threw me under the bus. And what happened later on, though, is that another oncologist who is retired uh, approached me because he heard my story. And this is the one I've quoted in the book. So this, so listen to the, what this other oncologist says. He, he's, he was wonderful. So he comes up to me and he says, can you show me your medical records? I said, sure. I took him to the hospital where it happened. He scrutinized my medical records and he said, whichever way I look at it, you should be dead. And then he said to me, so I said to him, if this is the case, how come my oncologist said what he did when the newspaper asked him? And he said, I don't blame him. He's part of the system. He's like the head professor of oncology at the top teaching hospital in Hong Kong. Um, he had to say that because people would go on a witch hunt after him if he didn't, if he said anything different. So this guy's explaining that to me and he says, I was part of that system but I'm retired now, so I can say whatever I want. So he wrote me a testimonial. And he said to me, he said, you know, I'll be honest with you. I am afraid of cancer. And I'm also, and I'm equally afraid of the, um, of the treatment of cancer. I am as afraid of cancer as I am of the treatment of cancer, which is why I'm so fascinated by healings like yours. And he said, I don't research cancer drugs. I don't research earlier detection um, equipment. I don't research any of that. I research people who've healed because yes. that's what I'm interested in. So he was amazing. So he wrote this testimonial for me, which then went into my book. He said, if you ever write a book, feel free to use my name and use my testimonial. I wrote it. In, in my book. And what happened subsequently is, thank God, um, I had his, his help, his support. I had his, testimoni his testimonial. He had plucked out the pages from my medical records, which he said were relevant to show if anyone asks, which are the pages I showed Dr. Oz, who was blown away. And because um, my medical records were this thick. So, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. So Absolutely. Peter Coe plucked out the few pages that he said would be relevant. And, and then what happened though, is after my book came out, um, so there's this whole quote, this whole passage that Dr. Peter Coe wrote this testimonial for me. So what started happening is people who are skeptics who don't want this to be true, they started researching Dr. Peter Coe. Now he is a retired oncologist who does not practice anymore. He stopped practicing uh, 12 years ago, 15 years ago. So this happened to me 12 years ago. So people are researching, looking for him today. He is hardly on the internet because you're not. If you, if you look yeah. up a doctor that's retired 10, 12 years ago, yeah. they're not on the internet. No. So I have all these people writing to me saying, Dr. Peter Coe doesn't exist. He's not on the internet. <laughs> and then there is actually a forum that is out to debunk Dr. Peter Coe saying there is no such person. There you go. Yeah. There you go. And you do something else that is, because I gave your book to a friend of mine recently diagnosed with multiple myeloma. I think it was a YouTube video as well. And the phrase you said is, and then I realized why I got cancer. 
And then I lost him. I lost him. I said, okay, I mean, he's going to most likely die of this disease, which is, looks like it's happening. And it was most people cannot and will not do the one step that would save their lives, which is look at how they're using their life energy and take responsibility for how and using their own power. That means if you're married to an energy vampire, if you're working for an energy vampire, if your mother or father is an energy vampire, it is your job, it is your sole work to preserve your energy. This is the only place where you have any influence yeah. right here. And when you say to someone, now I know why I got cancer, what they do in, in this culture, you go right to victim. I didn't cause my cancer. Yes, they well, do that. Well, your intellect did not cause your cancer. Your intellect did not cause it. No. You are not to blame, but there is a part of you that is responsible that can turn this around. And therein lies all the power for everything. And to me, it's where I've come to realize any place that society says, don't look there, that's where the power is. Every time, don't go there. Oh my God. Don't call a spade a goddamn shovel. Don't go there. That's where the power is. Every yes. Time, every time. I have one question. How were your parents when you went, when you left that guy? What did they do, your parents? <laughs> <laughs> interestingly, interestingly, my mom was more supportive than I expected her to be. My dad was semi. Um, uh, my parents were not as bad as the rest of the community and a lot of other relatives who felt that I had brought shame to my community, to myself. <laughs> And yeah. I was also told that no Indian man would marry me after what I had done. That's what I was told. <laughs> oh, man. That's just institutionalized. Yeah. Oh, right? Yeah. yeah. And, but I was such a little rebel in my own way. And I said, well, I don't want to marry an Indian man after what I've been through. Oh, see, that's very good. Yeah. Why would I want one of those? <laughs> yeah. Why would I want one of those? Exactly. Right. right. But so. you know, but I ended up marrying an Indian man who is the one of the most amazing. He's the most amazing person in my life. And um, definitely not an energy vampire because he really, truly supports me in everything I do. Yes. Yes, and, exactly. Yeah. So I think, you know, that people kind of know what they're dealing with here um, now. <laughs> and I feel very badly if you're just waking up to this. I do. I know how hard it is. But let me just say, on the other end, it's just life. Someone texted me this morning, how are you? I said, I am the best I've ever been in my entire life. I'm happier than I have ever, ever been. Because my energy field works for me. And I'm now, all the vampires are are gone from my life and they used to be very close <laughs> so now I can I see who they are and I can identify them now this doesn't mean by the way you know someone said to me once well everyone deserves love and I said I agree with you yeah. everyone deserves love starting with you starting with you so exactly you, yeah and it's interesting when you're in a relationship with one of those you give about 90%, they give 10, and you think you have a partnership. It's only when you get into a real partnership that you've, you see what that's like. So we all need empaths. We all need instruction in receiving. In we do. And that's, that's really important because most empaths don't know how to receive. They really don't. They're givers. They're rescuers. They don't know how to receive. Yeah. As one of my empath friends said, she says, Here's how I was as a kid. Please be happy so I don't have to be miserable. <laughs> you know, because you can't stand it when someone's miserable. Yeah. You we have everything take... in your power to lift them up. You know, now it's like, you know, if you're really going to be miserable like that, why don't you walk around the block, then come back. I'll talk. <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> right. Right. 
Oh gosh, you know, this has been an amazing conversation and I'm just being aware of your time. And I think it's, it's really important. I know that my audience are absolutely going to love it. And, um, and I, I am actually going to include a link to your book in the, in the post, um, because I myself can't wait to get my hands on it and read it myself. And I really think that you are a beautiful example of what, uh, you know, of what people should be and know and, um, and not be afraid, not be afraid to be who we are. Because I truly believe that empaths, um, you know, we've been told to grow a thicker skin and to have stronger boundaries. But actually, I don't think empaths are the ones who need the tools. I think we are the ones who are closer to being human. And we are the ones that need to shine our light and embrace who we are. I couldn't agree more. And the more we do it, and the faster we do it, the more, the more quickly we literally create doorways that shut out the energy vampires. They will yes. either change or they'll recycle themselves. But we need to stop enabling them. It is the kindest, most loving thing we can do for them and yes. for ourselves. And, and for, for the world. Yes. 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 Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and thank you so much for your time. Really, thank you. It thank was, you. It was, loved, it. L- loved it too. It was such a pleasure talking to you. Thank we'll, you, Nita. We'll talk again soon. All right.